true survivor after 16 months away. Here comes a purple rock podcast to brighten up your day. The season will be different with no theme and fewer days. It's good to see the show adapting to our lazy ways. We tell you who the hosts are, but we're running out of time. It's the Purple Rock Survivor Podcast. Welcome to the Purple Rock Survivor Podcast. I am John. My co-host is Andy. We had our first reward challenge of the season this week. And your reward, dear listener, is that we're going to come into your ears, so phrasing. Oh, my God. And discuss this week's episode, um, season 41, episode four. Andy, how'd you like this one? I love it. This this is great. Almost as good as, uh, no, I can't even repeat what you said. (laughs) Yeah, that I, as soon as the words were leaving my mouth, I was like, "Nope, they can't take it back now." Yeah, just all this. No, I keep getting bad things in my head, man. Uh, no, this is good. This is great. This is a great way to start the podcast. We're keeping it at all stays. Yes, definitely. Um, and then actually, this is our second attempt to start the podcast <laughs> because I had a coughing fit when we first tried. Yeah, this one's a disaster. But you know what wasn't a disaster? That episode of television. What what a bang up forty two minutes. It was so good. Um, hey, you know what? I'll say fifty minutes. There's probably eight good minutes of commercials in there. I don't know. I didn't watch them, but I bet they were great. Yeah, I mean, some of them. I mean, there had to been promos for you know some cop show or something that I bet it was amazing. Oh, definitely. Uh, love me some copaganda. Um, totally agree with you, by the way. Awesome episode. We started with, uh, Shan letting Jeannie know about Brad's advantage. Later, we got to see Shan scheming about JD's extra wood advantage. So really, like, I think we can all agree advantages are just what made this episode so good. Yeah, no, it really brings a drama and interest to uh, Survivor as a product as a whole. And I think everybody who loved this episode uh, realized it's because of the advantages. Uh, yeah. The advantages that are just proliferating through this entire season uh, and uh, been kind of the standard for every single vote. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm sure that's what's driving all the love for this episode. <laughs> definitely not the fact that we got to see some really great characters shine in this one. I mean, I think I said last week that I've been pleasantly surprised. Like, we we can drop into any tribe and I'm always like, hey, you know, I I like seeing these people. There's not a single tribe where I'm like, oh, man, not these people again. There's just the cast is spread out well into the tribes where I'm like, I have points of interest in every single tribe. Yeah, and the show has been doing a lot of interesting things, playing around with its form yeah. in really delightful ways. Um, you know, what, how like in Twitter often they have like those uh, just, you know, response posts of like, what's your most unpopular opinion or whatever. And, you know, there is those every once in a while for Survivor, like anything, your most uh, unpopular Survivor opinion. And often people will then quote tweet it with things that are actually fairly popular opinions. Yes. I, I think mine is, and this episode showed it, is... Um, the editors of Survivor are freaking magicians. They are miracle workers and possibly the best editors on TV. And I'm not just saying that because they did interesting thing this time. Um, this was just proof of that. I, I think they always do a great job. And generally when people complain about the edit, it's because they're complaining that the edit is telling the story that they wish the season wasn't going to be about. Um, but yes, I think they've stepped up their game. These, you know, great editors. And I think one of the ways that they did that. And there, there were several in this one, but one of the ways they did that is by, again, getting creative with their storytelling. They had Evie talking about the uh, previously on Survivor and, and narrating how that segment would go. And then the editors are like, screw it, we're just going to lean into this. And they actually put some footage. They had probes talking. It was great. It was a fun little bit. And then, as if that wasn't enough, later on, we got just a bang-up job of narration for that challenge, not by Jeff Probst. Yeah, no, and obviously they set it up really well with the discussion between Deshaun and Danny and whether they're going to throw the challenge or not. And, you know, they leave it open-ended with Danny not wanting to do that. It goes against, you know, his ethics as a competitor or whatever. And then it's like, yeah, okay, we're going to do it. And, oh, my God, that was so delightful. Um, Normally, you know, I uh, we're going to get into, like, the ethics of throwing challenges and all that. Eliza, I hope you're listening. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I hope not. Um, <laughs> but just in general, it's like, well, usually if they're going to show it, it might not work well. But frankly, I I often root for it because, like, let's go. Let's chaos. But 
as it starts developing and we get these guys, you know, sharing their story, sticking really well to the future tense, like not, you know, not spoiling what's going on. Um, I'm like, oh, God, I hope this fails. I hope this fails so bad. <laughs> and you're just rooting against them. Like, ah, it was so intense, the, those final throws. It's like, come on, fail at this. I have not been more invested in a challenge in a very long time. It was so much fun. Yeah, he's like, oh, they're talking about throwing it. And then, like, they, they keep, every time we're watching, it's like, but they're in first place. Like, <laughs> and not even, like, a close for They're not just nudging ahead. They're just lapping the field. We're trying to do this. And then I look over and you saw his swimming the wrong direction. <laughs> and then you see Probe saying, like, no, no, Evie, that way. Okay, you're almost there. <laughs> oh, God. It was painful. And then Deshaun, just amazing. I started tying knots instead of untying. That's just amazing. It just, Deshaun, as the narrator for that, was awesome. And an excellent job of, again, with the editing, just cutting back and forth between uh, Deshaun in a little um, confessional, showing the action on the screen from the challenge, just going back and forth, letting us into Deshaun's head as this challenge was going down. And it was great. And there's plus there was some cuts during the challenge to Danny making the most pained faces as they kept succeeding despite every effort they were making to fail. It was so great. So I was like, all right, the hoops, I got this. This is the time I can do it. <laughs> and finally, there's a chance that I can actively submarine this challenge. Yeah, and this here's like, let me know when you want to change. Let me know. And I think eventually Nasir just jumps in. Otherwise, it would have been like, all right, Danny, you got this. Yeah. And the, even better is like uh, Deshaun had tried to find the key and throw it away. And then they cut back and it was like, oh, we found yeah. the key. Like, shit. Oh, my God. That was amazing. <laughs> just all the ways they wanted to fail, they couldn't. So great. And I wonder, like, you know, I think some of it is a, a conscious attempt to be more creative. I think they've let loose um, some of the restrictions they may have put on their storytelling. Um the season, I think maybe because they're just embracing a bit more that like our, our fans are fine with some metatextual stuff and all of that. Uh, but I also like, like, yeah, Deshaun is a wonderful narrator. Like he's, he takes the L with such good spirits about it that it becomes a fun thing to do. You know, uh, how I, they might not have been able to do something like this in the past because somebody might have just been angry or like, like he's really animated and telling the story and it's great. I, I think we had, like, we've had some, not ever in a challenge like this, but I think in recent seasons we've also like maybe Tony like uh, uh, when he's describing when you know he got his um you know advantage. And he's like, I was so excited to get extorted, extortion. It's great. <laughs> a thing you love to hear from cops. Um, so like yeah, I think and it's similar to that. It's just there's such great enthusiasm with him telling this war story of the one that got away. And uh, not only that, there was also the little moments. Like, I I really enjoyed. Danny's stuff just as much as just nah, not just as much. Deshaun's was still just, no. He's a good balance. They're, they're a good duo. You know, it was. And I think just Danny being impressed by Nasir, like damn, go off. Like he's just standing there watching Nasir just body these bricks through. <laughs> he's like, all right, yeah. I'm like I'm trying to. Everybody else, the other tries all did it one person, but they're like, I'm trying to slow it down. But nope, Nasir's not gonna let that go. <laughs> Sears just throwing himself at these blocks and they're flying through. And Danny's like, oh, shit, okay, I guess we're just doing this. Yeah, I mean, don't hate the player, you know, <laughs> right. for winning. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, so th the highlight is obviously them and their failed attempts at failing. But you still get a beautiful JT moment in that as well. Uh, to uh, sew up the win, almost. And that's editing too, right? The amazing editors of Survivor, because that was all the build and the swell. This is the hero moment. Yes, hit us with the music that it was gonna, it was gonna happen. This was it. They were successfully gonna throw the challenge, and JD pulls it off. Nope, absolutely yeah. not. He yells out, "Money!" Uh, he almost turns about. No, you know why he doesn't do the Nick Young turn around? No. Back like I got this. He actually does follow his shot. Um, but and then it's like a very quick cut to womp womp. They're like they don't like turn back and then give like Nasir a similar edit. It's like and then there you go. Nasir got it. You lost. Another fun little moment, and uh, Carter fan pointed this out in our comments. Just the juxtaposition 
of earlier in the episode, Danny saying you never lose when you give 100%. And then they won immunity while giving significantly less than 100%. Right. You never lose, man. You lost. Danny knows his own creed. Oh, no, that, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, and for, uh, I, I loved it. I loved actually both challenges because I, you know, that it also gave me opportunities many times, like when they were throwing the balls up in the reward one to keep saying, dunk it every time JD had the ball. Come on, JD, <laughs> dunk it. Only to find out in exit interviews that he says he's five foot eight, which only makes last week that much better. It does. Um, and there was yet another fun point in the challenge, which again, in a car- commenter pointed out, this was Candace from Raro Tribe. Great name. Um, Tiffany is inexplicably just really good at throwing things at things like what a fun subplot she clearly went to the uh reynolds school and learned her throwing skills people say i never do this but i'm about to admit uh being wrong about something Uh, a few weeks ago my initial impression after they lost that challenge and tiffany was really bad getting across the balance beam is like my initial instinct was that they should just get rid of tiffany they can't afford to keep losing like this obviously i said i was one over to the idea that yeah okay getting rid of xander would be a good goal I was wrong. Uh, Tiffany has been great in the challenges. She she has this niche. uh, Like, she killed it in both of these. uh, And she did just fine last week. So, you know, there you go. I was wrong about that one specific thing. She just has one glaring weakness. (laughs) Yeah, and you know what? Some people have really sucked at balance beams in the past. Uh, It's a thing. So... Uh, no, yeah, I loved it. The big question, of course, is, uh, should they have been throwing it? Was that the smart play? I'm, I, I, I love them so much that they did. Thank yes. you. Uh, highlight of the season, possibly. Hopefully not. Hopefully they just, it gets better. But, um, should they have done it? Yeah, I mean, for my entertainment purposes, definitely. Uh, for their strategic purposes in the game, I mean, <laughs> I get the very, flimsy reasoning that they used about you know we got to get rid of erica she's scheming and you know we don't want to go into a merge fully intact because then that makes us targets seems pretty speculative though i mean even if you do go into the merge fully formed in track or fully intact tribe yeah maybe they target you for the first vote or two but they're not gonna pagong you then like at a certain point other priorities are gonna come up Sure, but if you're Danny and Deshaun, who's the first target? And that is totally reasonable from their perspective. Yeah, and that, those were the people discussing it, right? Yeah, if you're Heather, and like, hey, they're not going to target me. I need to get through, like, two more votes and I'm golden. But yeah, so, like, from that, I understand people wondering, like, when does that ever happen? Um, about, you know, like, ganging up. It, it has happened. I think it's only happened only one time that I can think of is Healers, Hustlers, whatever the other H was. Um, the healers tribe did not lose. Then they had, they went from three tribes to two in swaps and they, or I think they just went three to the reshuffled at three. That's when Rourke was targeted by survivors of the, the other two. I don't know, something like that. And then at the merge, they also take out Jessica. And the very, like, the whole reasoning behind all of this was that we got to start taking out healers. So it has happened, but that's like once. Every other time that like the the tribe that was went in really strong, it wasn't so much that the other tribes were like ganging up on them, were threatened by their numbers, so much as those other tribes um, collapsed and wanted to take each other out. Right? They're like, yep. "Hey, no, we got to take out Penner," and instead, Kent Jeff Kent goes. Or, uh, and that was actually the the slightly weaker tribe. Or yeah, they all wanted to get rid of RC because yeah, she's, she's RC. RC. Um, yeah, they all wanted to get rid of Joe Anglum in the uh, you know uh, Edge of Extinction, that sort of thing. Which I mean, so Luvu was getting a jump on that by throwing the challenge. Hey, let's not wait for us to uh, fall apart at the merge due to our own uh, business when we can do it now. Yeah, I mean, I think the funny thing to me was that it's been eight days. In a normal Survivor season, we would have had two tribal councils by this point. Like it, it just felt like they so desperately want to get to that fireworks factory like come on we gotta get to a tribal council see what it's like and there are so many variables that could happen prior to a vote once you get to a swap merge whatever it might be situation it's just overthinking it really just roll with what you've got and deal with the consequences once you hit the merge because i think another thing is the expectation is that danny or deshaun would be the ones targeted once they hit the merge that hasn't always been the case. I mean, I think we've even had a blog at some point that proved that's not always the case. 
No, but if you're playing numbers, I, I if I would completely understand them feeling threatened uh, at the merge time. That is the time. Frankly, uh, often more they're not necessarily targeted at the merge because they were already voted out before now because people don't wait for the merge. Um, in general, I am not opposed to the idea of throwing challenges. There are many situations in Survivor which it is a strategically sound play. I do not believe that this was those times. Uh, honestly, like generally, what it is is that. It post swap. If a swap scenario hands you over somebody who is threatening on another tr- uh, from the other side, sure, get rid of them. The show gave them to you to do so. Uh, generally, doing so will often have like a double um, bonus in that you get rid of somebody you're not aligned with who is strong, who at that moment, due to you know the vagaries of the show, is made uh, vulnerable. And you might save somebody that you were aligned with from being voted out because they don't go to tribal council. Uh, so in those scenarios, it makes sense to me. This clearly was not that scenario. Um, and why the difference is, is that in that other scenario, you can be pretty confident about where the vote is going. Exactly. And who's going to be with you. The thing I don't like about this is, are we confident they have four votes? You know, like I think, you know, Danny, Deshaun and Sydney. I think, I think they can lock that in and we can yep. get into that a bit more. But that's three of six. Who Who's their fourth? It's clearly not Erica. I, I think we can put that uh, down. Uh, it would be weird if they're suddenly uh, trusting Nasir, like Danny and Deshaun specifically. Um, so I guess they, they're they counting Heather, which, okay, they didn't see the secret scene where we know that they're targeting Sydney. Like, it, 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 at the very least, there should be some doubt because they haven't done the things you need to do that proves loyalty yet. Well, so they didn't see the secret scene, but they did live it where Heather was telling them that she's, she doesn't trust Sydney because of her dream. Yes. Now, I mean, that was, you know, forever ago, at sure. least four or six days. Like, it, I, it's totally reasonable that maybe they do have Heather, that Heather's on their side. Um, if for no other reason than maybe Heather's like, I'm not going to like rocks over this. You have three. The other three aren't quite a three. Uh, but that's not like a heck of a gamble. Uh, now one note that they should have, if like Deshaun really believes in this plan and this is what needs to be done is when they go to tribal council, he will receive another vote. He doesn't have an extra vote yet, but that's a technicality. Now I suppose he doesn't a hundred percent know he has that vote. In fact, he doesn't a hundred percent know that he has a vote. You know, if he, if he was lying to him all those four days ago about that he can get it if he wants it. Um, they'd be throwing a challenge in him not even having a vote at all. Like, so there's just a lot going on here. And it's just, and for what transgression are we discussing? I understand wanting to vote, not like trust Erica, given the conversation. I don't know that she crossed a line. It's like, that's it. We got to move heaven and earth to get rid of her. Right. Exactly. Uh, as I said, it felt a little premature to be making that move. And I think it's a much safer bet to just roll the dice by not rolling the dice and go in with a strong six. And it seems like that's actually a thing happening a lot this season. Maybe it's happening a lot lately in Survivor. Is they're just too quick to jump to, well, now we got to vote them out rather than why don't we try to defuse the situation? Why don't we try to work with this? You know, like Eric, who was talking to you, Deshaun, and I do like in the initial conversation, and he's done this a few times now, that he accepts information yep. without seeming to reciprocate. Obviously, edit, we don't know, but it was the same thing with Evie, right? He listens and he's like, oh, yeah, oh, mm-hmm. man, that's crazy. And they just keep feeding him stuff. And I really like that about him. Well, and he does it as a really active listening thing, too. He'll, like, yeah. engage in a conversation. So it seems like it's some sort of exchange of information going on when really he's just sort of encouraging you to keep information dumping. Yeah. But it's like you could – Go back to her and say, let's not do that. I think we, you know, let's put a pin in that. That's great information. But right now we should just focus on like having us six. Um, Because there's the other thing, like I understand that she is a threat to Sydney, but she isn't a threat to Deshaun. You know, she, she's going to you, Deshaun. She knows she, she trusts you. So I wouldn't mind keeping her around. Like, if forced to a decision about this, I would understand him wanting to vote out Erica. Because uh, the thing that uh, I have, don't have trouble figuring out that it seems like a lot of people on Twitter are is when they're keeping like, I don't understand why all these things, like when Nasir tries to vote somebody out or Erica tries to vote somebody out, that it's such a crime. Uh, 
Deshaun and Sydney are allies. That's what's going on here. It's really not that complicated. So when somebody goes to them about voting their ally off, they're like, I don't want to do that. Let me tell my ally about it so we can work together. And if you think Sydney's a bad ally for him, keep in mind that she has told him every time somebody's targeting him or daddy. So that's a pretty solid ally move as far as ally moves go. Moves right. Go. That would be the sort of thing I'd look for in an ally. Someone that's yes. willing to give me information relevant to my situation. There you go. And it, it's, and this is the one area where we actually have seen it be the reciprocal between Deshaun. Yep. Uh, he has also you know, done the same through her. So you know, whether you want him to be allied with her or not, we can get into that uh, later. Uh, they clearly are actions. I'm just suggesting that. But yeah, uh, honestly, if they have been throwing the challenge to get rid of Nasir, the guy who's targeting, like, you know, Deshaun and Danny, that would actually make more sense. Uh, and his argument about, like, the danger Erica could pose to him specifically also makes some sense. You know, she's the type of player who could use Danny and Deshaun as shields and then advance. Whereas, I mean, frankly, telling him that, like, there's people who want to target Sydney, it's like, cool. <laughs> there's somebody that people might vote out instead of me? What a great ally. Otherwise, or that you don't like her and maybe I could take her to the end? Also great for Deshaun. Everything's coming up me. Um, but, again, that doesn't seem like, well, we got to vote her out now. It'd be like, a, I should keep an eye on Erica for later scenarios. So, I, I don't think it was a good idea, but they, they went for it. Do they should, should they do it again? I was just going to say, now... They will have another opportunity next week. <laughs> Do they They try again? Because maybe next week's challenge is more suitable for throwing. You know, maybe it's a puzzle where uh, Danny and Deshaun can volunteer for the puzzle portion and just be like Tony and Kagai and just throwing pieces around with no real intent of ever actually figuring out the puzzle. I mean, next week. They have to sit out three people, I think. So, you know, maybe they just sit out and be like, Heather and Nasir and you know, Erica, go at it. Um, yeah. Well, since, given that I didn't think it was a good idea this week, I think I might also suggest that it's not a good idea next week, especially because the, you know, the, the purported worry other than the threat posed by Erica um, is that they're worried that they're going to be, you know, outnumbered. The other two tribes will get together to vote some of them out. Well, if they win next week, uh, they can't. The math wasn't worked there. Their six would be as many as the non Luvu six. So right now it's a six seven. And yeah, so I say, and also you're not good at throwing challenges. So stick to your strengths. Just Clearly. win, baby. <laughs> yeah. And um, there would be extra votes once a merge situation came up. But again, it's just getting way into the weeds. Like, forget it. Just win and see what happens. I think that's yeah. their best strategy. It's what they're good at, as you mentioned. Just roll with that. I do wonder if a little extra thing that we do see in the previews is that, uh, yeah, I think Deshaun is, and maybe Danny, I believe it was Deshaun that was speaking. It's kind of noticing a bit of the pattern of the recent uh, vote out targets. Um, so in that sense, you might be like, uh, maybe we should get rid of a woman before they get rid of yet another dude. Because again, if their concern is at the merge, we're going to be in trouble. Um, I don't know if recent events, you know, with the back-to-back -back voting of Voce, Brad, and JD would make them feel less like that is the case. I guess we'll just have to see. But yeah, yeah I, I think especially for them, that might be a reasonable concern because if you're going into a merge and they do want to take out the six, yeah, then maybe not. They not only want to take out that fully intact tribe, they want to specifically continue the pattern that's already been emerging. But, you know, it was delightful that they did it. So, it, it, you know, do I, my, I take it all back. If you can make it that fun again, do it. Do it, do it, everybody. <laughs> all right. So the important thing is that we got to a vote and we lost our beloved JD. Hey, let, let's talk this one out. Like, how did you feel losing JD? So literally after, like, at his torch is snuffed, my wife says, oh, sorry, babe. <laughs> <laughs> she knows. <laughs> hey, for me... Honestly, it was like when we lost Chris Noble. It's like, ah, uh, yes. I wish that he was still around for my entertainment purposes, but I, I can't, you know, judge. This is the time. Like, this, this is the way that it had to be. Now, hopefully it's not like that because actually that was like the last entertaining episode of that season. Yes. Um, I don't think that'll be the case this time, but it was just like, yeah, no, I mean, JD was the star of the burn bright. And it had to be this way, you know, just how many more times could he hand over his advantage? I don't know. And see, I, I think, yes, there certainly are some of these types 
that have a shelf life. Um, like they just couldn't keep up this energy and keep delivering long term. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like JD could have kept it up. Like Chris Noble had probably a couple more episodes in him. I think JD probably, you know, he could have made mid merge and still kept this energy going. And I would have just loved the ride. I mean, he's like, he's funny. He's charming. He's confident. He's terrible at survivor. It's just great. I just thoroughly enjoyed the experience. Yeah, no, I do believe he would continue to be entertaining as long as he was on the show. Uh, that's why he's been like our header image for like three out of the four podcasts we've done so far. Um, but it's hard to argue that like getting Eric Riken backed out of the game isn't just a perfect like you know, ending for him. It was. And also, I mean, for me personally, as a big Shan fan so far this season, like it, it felt like the uh, uh, Millennials versus Gen X thing where when Michaela left, like Jay was the one that did it. Like, OK, you know, I'll, I'll accept this. Like, damn, it hurt to have that happen. But at the same time, what a way to go out. It was just very fitting. Now, uh, I should point out that, you know, while JD, like, wanted to be Malcolm and then, you know, had more of an Eric thing, Eric, of course, did beat Malcolm. So, yeah, uh, props to him for that. Yeah. Uh, but, yes, um, get tricked into get, handing over your thing and then getting voted out. That's that's the move here. Um, and, yeah, so it was a, 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 a good conclusion to the story, If I, even if I didn't want the story to end. But was it the right conclusion? Was it the right decision? See, I think... The majority opinion this week seems to be like, what the hell, Shan? What are you doing? I And again, I, I think previously the commenters had been like, oh, no, Evie should have definitely or she definitely did the right thing. This was great. And I was like, uh, I mean, it's it's fine. In this case, I I don't think it was such a misstep for Shan. I mean, I think it's ultimately it came down to two allies that had flaws um, and I think too many people are acting as though she made this terrible strategic mistake. And I, I don't think it's that bad and I'll give some justifications for it, but I want to hear what you think about it. Uh, I understand why you'd want to do it, but every argument that I've read about the danger posed or potentially posed by JD, uh, also applies to Genie, but more, you know, like uh, there's less assurances, you know, Genie isn't handing over everything she has every two days to Shan, the way that JD has been, um, you know, so could he flip on her? Of course, everybody in Survivor could flip on somebody. I'm sorry that we can't find the perfect situation where the decision would be so clearly defined. And thus, since we can't define it so clearly, then there's no bad decision. Literally daughters vote out moms in this game. Anybody can flip on anybody. I hope you've learned that game-changing lesson. But, like, <laughs> if you're Shan, if you don't feel after what you did to JD in this very episode, like, this very day, that he's somebody who you can kind of work with, at least in the sense of, I know what's going to happen with that guy. Um, then you're never going to feel that way about anybody. You know who else could flip on her? Ricard could flip on her. Um, you know, and so like, I understand her maybe like, I don't want to work with this knucklehead anymore. I am done. You know, I'm trying to work with this teenager. Uh, that I totally get. And you shouldn't have voted. You should have voted him out last week, uh, instead of Brad, but Hey man, the best time to do something is, you know, before the next best is now. Um, but you made that choice to vote out Brad. You isolated Jeannie. I don't believe her feelings about that were secretive. In fact, they, they were uh, very, fairly vocal in a way that I think uh, Shan did not handle well. Meanwhile, like, she can get JD to do whatever she wants. So, like, even if you think he poses a threat, it's like, do you really think he poses a threat? Like, I understand, like, you could say, well, he might want to do something else. That's cool. What has JD successfully done so far that he <laughs> wanted to do? Up to and including dunking a fucking beanbag. So I will say the genie scene right at the beginning was the first time this season where I've been like, oh, no, this is a misstep for Shan. I'm not loving how this is starting. However, we don't know the type of person genie is. Genie clearly blew up there. But, you know, a day later and with some food and time behind it, she's back to being friendly, at least with them. So much so that she's willing to trust Shan, not play her dice that's not a dice, and then go along with Shan and Ricard's plan. The other thing is, 
Ricard is an important part of this alliance. And we don't really get to see his perspective. So we're assuming this is all Shan decided to take JD out and that she might have been motivated by the double vote thing. I think the double vote was just like a bonus. Like this was something she was going to do anyway. And it was like, uh, well, I, I can keep his vote. That'll be a plus. Um, I think Ricard, probably despite not really loving Jeannie, might not have liked JD any better. Um, and I think there's there's a few flaws with JD, just as there are with Jeannie. They're not the same flaws. But just as an example, how many connections does Jeannie have with anyone on, a, on another tribe? How many connections does JD have? How many do you know that he has if you're Shan? He went off and met two other people from the other tribe. You don't know what was said. He came back. Everybody doubted his story. So you don't necessarily know what was said there. If he made any sort of connections that he can exploit once the tribes merge. Jeannie, you know, that is a known thing. She knows zero people from other tribes. How many connections do you really need to be like, hey, I want to vote out somebody that's not you guys. Can I Can I do that? Like, I don't know if, like, you need a big secret of plan. But also, yeah, you didn't trust JD that first time. You haven't trusted JD with anything because he's transparent and easily fooled. Like, you know, I just don't. Like, well, so that's the other problem, though, is that with JD as your ally, he's very fun and charming. Also super talkative. And a little transparent. And I don't think he's just transparent to Shan. I think he's transparent to basically everyone. So if you have him keyed in on your clever plans that you might be trying to orchestrate for when a merge comes, he might not be the most valuable ally to you. Yes, it's great that he's going to be loyal to you. But is that loyalty going to matter when he fucked up and told another person your plan and now it got submarined and you're getting voted out anyway? There's some real risk in that. And so I don't think it's necessarily that, you know, JD was a clear cut, got to keep him because he's loyal. That's not the only attribute that you need. Yeah, no. So when the initial and like the episode initially ended, I was closer to that. Like, man, I get not wanting to play this game with that guy. Like, he <laughs> yes. just makes it harder than it needs to be. I just think that once you did the Brad move like two days before this, this is the part you're locked into for the short term. And the good news is JD's probably more likely to get himself voted out than you. Um, which, I mean, again, could still sink your plans. But it's just – I think because of the previous decisions that at this point I think we can say is are, were wrong. I, last week we were like, yeah, no, vote out Brad. Now with your further evidence – um, they really should have kept Brad and voted out JD just then. If if the motivation is just like I can't work with this knucklehead. Uh, but what a lot of people are arguing is that JD poses the greater threat to Shan, and those people are just making stuff up because yes. they want to support Shan. That kid is not threatening to Shan at all. There's the, I don't know how more much more you could signal that he is not both in the sense that she sees right through him that you know he has never gotten one up on her that he's you know not really capable of being threatening to many people uh but also like he's handed her his boat twice I don't I can, I, you could make the argument that he has proven more loyalty than anyone in the history of Survivor has ever proven it's like this the, her act of this episode was pretty shallow and like most people would see through it but not my man JT he's like okay well here you know, and not only does he say here's my, my thing but it's like oh that desperation wasn't a good look on Shad like he is so <laughs> sure of himself and uh, his superiority and control of the game. Remember that, you know, Shan knows this game better than anyone except for me. Like, this is who JD is. What up to everybody who is now using his exit interviews as proof, by the way. I'm glad that you decided now that, like, uh, present tense JD is so much more reliable in his assessment of situations than, you know, Island JD ever was. Yeah. And so that's the thing is I would never, <laughs> ever. First of all, I didn't read his exit interviews No, no, yet. no. I know you didn't. Although I'm excited to do so because I thoroughly enjoy that guy. Um, yeah, I wouldn't take anything he says completely seriously. I mean, he's clearly not the most reliable narrator of his own six Yeah, stories. so he's like, oh, no, I was trying to work with, you know, uh, Genie to get them out. Genie in this episode, when we're talking about threats here, uh, was telling Shan that she wanted to vote out Ricard. Like, that was her first move. And Shan had to work against that to get her to vote for JD. So, 
Right. So for one, uh, if JD was really trying, that just shows that he's terrible at Survivor. That like JD's own plan, he couldn't convince her of. So I don't think he was because again, my evidence is that uh, he keeps handing his thing over to Shan. A weird way to work against somebody to say, you know, like you could just hang on to it. You know, I understand. It's like, well, I can't get Jeannie to vote with me. There's no point in playing it. Cool. Don't give it away then. If you're really trying to work against somebody, then down the line, it might be the, you made it more difficult for yourself by not having an advantage that could help you out with that, which say this time you successfully vote out Jeannie. Next time you might want to force a tie, but you can't because you handed your idol to this person you're working against that you clearly don't trust with everything in your life. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, no, look, so yeah, I get not wanting to work with him, but I think the bed was made at that point. Um, so I do think that it was probably the wrong decision because here's another piece of evidence that's like, we can't really factor into the decision making, but for people who feel really good about chance decision and they're going to, you know, fight on the internet about it because that's what we do. This is what this is all about. Sure. I fight with people that can't even respond to me. Um, Jeannie finds the idol next week. Well, she finds a beware advantage. That's right. We don't know that it's an idol, but in normal situations, let's say in this hypothetical, Jeannie now is immune. Do you feel better about uh, Shan's decision to vote out her, JD? And I don't mean like, well, she couldn't have known that JD was going to find it. But if JD had the idol, who do you think is more likely to vote for Shan, Jeannie or JD? Maybe neither of them. Maybe both of them are going to vote for Ricard. Exactly. But I think it's much more likely that Jeannie would vote for Shan than it is JD. I don't think JD is ever voting for Shan, is my point. So the whole idea of like, you know, well, Ricard has a, a part to play. That's nice. He doesn't have the allies and the options that Shan does. Jeannie wants to vote him out. JD and J- Ricard aren't close. This is Shan's decision. I'm sure Ricard wants one thing or another, but he didn't have the connections that Shan had to exploit. This was her decision to make, and I don't think she made the right one because, again, I think she put herself in more immediate danger. And also, I don't – I mean, I think if you're concerned that Jeannie's going to come for Shan – I mean, she's already voted for Ricard once – and her plan in this episode was, let's take out Ricard. So, again, I don't know that Shan would necessarily need to be the one that's fearful. Especially because in this episode, she ends up convincing Jeannie to go along with the plan, which she follows through with. So, you know. No, I'm just like, of the two, uh, she had a fight with you know Jeannie two nights ago, and she's holding JD's idol, at, uh, her advantage at the time. So, okay. But I think... It's possible that the most likely scenario on both is that Ricard would suffer the punishment. Exactly. Uh, but you know, if we're talking about this, like, I just if we're talking about the uh, the vote advantage, if that is because that is the justification given in the episode, we don't know if that's uh, the real one or the deciding factor. She's like, yeah, cool, I'll have two votes, but with JD in the game, you had three. You know, so like you went from three to two and the the JD's vote is like, you know, a, a, a renewable resource, whereas the extra vote is a one time use only thing. So from that standpoint there. Um, so, and how did you feel when she was trying to get the advantage away from JD? <laughs> um, I, again, I, I viewed that more as a likely consequence of her having already decided to get rid of JD. And obviously that's not what we were shown on the show. Um it's just me inferring what's likely to happen. And this could just be my fandom of Shan's game so far, making me think that she's on this 40 chess game. But yeah, I mean, I I thought it was fine. I thought it was just a icing on the cake thing where she could get this vote. And she may or she may as well try it since they're voting him out anyway. I didn't think that that was the motivating factor. So you had already decided that was what was going to happen, even though they hadn't discussed it in the episode at all, that the JD would be the target. No, I was completely stunned. But I'm saying after watching the episode, I was like, okay, ah. well, then maybe this is why she was doing it. Because okay. I, I don't think that that was what caused her to vote JD. So when you were watching it, though, like, did you feel like, oh, yeah, no, this is a really smart play? Or you're like, oh, it's a bit much. Oh, I definitely thought she was still going to vote Jeannie. Well, I think there was also something that, like, she's worried that if Jeannie plays uh, the shot in the dark and then she's immune, then JD would have, like, two votes on the revote. Which, to be clear, we don't know if that would be how it would work at all. Uh, we, we've we never ha- seen somebody play an extra vote in a revote situation because revote situations are pretty rare. Yeah. Um, it would frankly make sense that you could. It's still voting. 
but I don't know. I know you can't play an idol in that scenario, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, at the time, I'm like, this is risky. Like, when I was watching, it's like, because most people should be able to be like, why do you want this so bad? You know, like, because the only reason why you'd really want it, other than, like, the one she's giving, I need this symbol of trust. Is like, I just gave it to you yesterday. <laughs> how, how, how many times do I need to renew this trust? If you didn't tr- trust me, why'd you give it back to me? And I also like that uh, JD is clearly a longtime Survivor fan, or at least has watched a bunch of the seasons. And yet, you know, couldn't learn from Eric's mistakes. <laughs> No, no, it's never backfired where no. you give something to somebody as a symbol of trust. I mean, I, it, it solidified Suri and Sarah. Um, it, well, you know, that's just why, you know, uh, Sandra and Denise went to the end. Like, there's no backfiring potential yep. at all. Um, the one thing I'll say for Shan is she might know her audience here. You know, there's yep. a reason why uh, Suri picked that sweet summer child, Eric, for this move. Uh, whereas the people are like, could we do that? It's like, well, I mean, with most people know, but this guy. <laughs> and I think, you know, there might be some of that in play for Shan as well. Um, I, I'm going to give her that credit. The one thing I, uh, I definitely came away from the scene, because it's like, I don't know, like I, I wouldn't have done it, but I'm not that persuasive. Is like, whether it's a good idea to do or not, it definitely shows she's got the skills for some things. Like there's some, there's a way to be impressed, even if it's like, ah, maybe don't do it that way. It's like, she clearly can get people to do things she wants to do, or at least this one person. And so that's roughly my assessment of her game is that her social game is so good that her strategic game can probably have some flaws in it and she'll be fine. I mean, we've seen that happen before, like Todd in China took a few strategic risks that maybe weren't ideal, but it worked out for him. Um, you you know you mentioned Sarah and Sari, that was risky, but Sarah certainly recovered and won that season. And you know, Tony, I don't even know that you would call Tony's win anything related to social skill. I guess in some ways, but you know, you can overcome some strategic flaws. And I think specifically with Shan, she has the type of game that's been so good at connecting with all these people. That I, again, I think I said it last week. I don't think that suddenly stops once they merge. You know, I think she starts picking up even more people that are going to be just as loyal and just as into working with her as she has now. I would absolutely say that Tony's win, especially a second one, had a social component to it. Tony, yes, Tony's second one, sure. Um, there's a reason why nobody ever votes for him, um, except in the end when most people do. Um, so yeah. Th- that's kind of where I'm at with Shan. I, I I don't hate it as much as I hated, like, Evie's vote a couple times ago. Because that one was predicated on the th- potential threat of Xander. Um, which I felt could easily bounce back on her. If it ever came to pass, it is not. Um, which I also said at the time, it might not come to pass. This one, I do think it's probably more likely it bounces back on Ricard. But it's just like, I, I think with JD, it would definitely never bounce back on Shan. So my motivation for analyzing the move is what's best for Shan. I'm not sure that this was. I feel like, yeah. But as I said, I get. Just be like, I'm done with this guy. Like, it's clear, like, in her, you know, confessionals, where, you know, she's, like, saying that he thinks he's Alan Iverson. Like, she's just tired of the JD experience. I mean, and then, you know, I think some people questioned the Alan Iverson comparison. But, in, you know, now knowing JD's height versus Alan Iverson's, doesn't it make a lot more sense? That's a good comp. Yeah, if uh, we just have to find out if JD likes the Cheesecake Factory as much as the truth <laughs> does. Um, the other thing was that, It was maybe me that had mentioned after the Evie quote unquote misstep that the most likely outcome was that nothing was going to come of it. Several episodes later, I think we can say nothing really came of it. Yeah, I mean, I did say it was like a 60% chance nothing comes of it. So that that is more likely than not. Um, So to recap, if we're going over all these different things we've said – you clearly think that the season so far has just been a strategic master ma- masterpiece by every decision maker so far. Absolutely. Because you have not challenged one vote decision yet. <laughs> You've been like every single one and said, no, that's the right thing to well, do. Well, see, and the problem is the, you know, the first votes, I was like, who fucking cares? Who cares? <laughs> I mean, who cares? <laughs> so. I, mean all, I guess if we're talking about um, right now that you know, Shan – um, should get rid of JD because he's a lot to deal with. She could have gotten rid of him then. Instead, she got rid of Sarah, who I imagine would have been fairly easy. To do. I do nothing of Sarah. I was like, sure, fine, sure, yeah, sure. get rid of Sarah. I, I, they're all like blank slates to me at this point. Now I have some attachment, and now I know Shan's game. And 
had Evie's game to a degree. That was, although part of it was with the Evie thing. It was like, I didn't think it was such a great move so much as like, it's not going to screw her over ultimately. Like the, the chances that it would come back and bite her in the ass were fairly low. Like, okay, fine, go for it, whatever. And it seems to have worked out. Still one more week. Um, so last week we talked a bunch about not understanding why people were saying that Sydney was a villain. Do we get it now? Oh, of course, because she tells people, hate me because you ain't me in the year 2021, unironically. So I get it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> I, I was saying that it's, it, it's pretty clear why people hate her. They ain't her. Uh, but yeah, no, that line also is like, oh, like a New England Patriots fan. Fantastic. That's great. Yes. Great, great, mm. great. The most beloved fan base. After that, um, after that confessional, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll allow it. Yeah, last week it was just like, I was just, it wasn't even like I was pro. It was more like, I, I don't see it. Why, why this passion for somebody who I feel like has just had a couple of scenes? And, you know, I, I theorized it could be because she was the antagonist to the people, person that they were rooting for in the scenes in which she was featured. But, you know, that confessional made sense that now that, you know, she gets a villain at it because, uh, frankly, there is no easier way for a woman to be branded a villain than to be conventionally attractive and then have the gall to admit that you're aware of that fact so like i get it i mean we've come a long way in 2021 but we haven't come so far that a reality show contestant can like as a woman express like self-confidence about themselves and not be a villain so uh yeah fill in 100 percent. you guys win honestly it just feels pretty contrived at this point like it just it feels like such a put-on act like is she really the hate me because you ain't me person is is that really who she is or is that just like oh i wanted to get cast on survivor and so i'm gonna lean into this thing like it it just to me feels not genuine whereas i think part of the reason i like so much of this cast is that they really are genuinely who they are and like jd is this person like shan is this person i'm enjoying these people for who they are sydney just she might be but it feels like an act yeah, she might be. I, I, we, here's the other thing. Um, we don't know who any of these people are. We never will. Um, but I actually liked that confessional until she got to the cliche at the end. I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, move it along. But, the you know, of course they're targeting me because I'm amazing. I'm so hot and all that. Oh, that was uh, fantastic. Because, you know, other than, like, changing a few adjectives here or there, like, it is completely something that I could imagine Boston Rob saying, Sandra, Tyson, Parvati. Um and if I'm not going to applaud it from them and then be like, tisk tisk, know your place, girl. Oh, no, we love the earned arrogance thing. And for, well, I don't care if it's earned or not at that point. Yeah. Um, so, and to the point, all those people I just listed there were on the villains tribe. So again, yeah, villain, absolutely. Um, uh, I want more of it. Yeah. I personally don't have a lot of time for false humility, especially in reality show contestants. Like, yeah, obviously every once in a while they'll cast a reality show contestant that's genuinely humble or genuinely has self-esteem issues that you know, reflect in not overcompensating. But most people who go on reality TV think that it's because they're, they're really awesome and they should be on TV. So I don't care. Uh, I found that entertaining. And if she does more of that, then not only do I feel like, you know, you know, feel free to, you know, brand her that way i mean she's she's uh reclining in her confessional so posture alone tells us that she's a villain as mm. as, as matt pointed out to us um yes. only villains relax that's right you know, otherwise i gotta hunch forward and be or maybe some sh shoulders something non-threatening i don't know uh but you know i still don't know if she's the villain of the season because i think there's somebody else who clearly has that spot yeah i think someone mentioned this in our comments and i i agree i mean it's I'm a fan of the person, but I wouldn't shake that label from them. Like, I, I think it could be appropriately applied. Yeah. So uh, shout out to DJ Cambodia. Shan. Shan is the villain of the season. She even has a villainous theme song. She's the one who is betraying people left and right, just taking people's confidence. So she picked on a poor 19-year-old boy and took, snatched his stuff and then voted him out and is and we'll probably have a smiling confessional about it next week. She she makes fun of people in confessionals. She talks about how excited she is to do dirt. That's your villain, and bravo! I love it. No, no, yes. no, no, no. Keep it, keep it up, keep it going. Yes, and uh, I, as you said with Sydney, sign me up. I'm all for this villainy. I want more of it. We've had so many seasons with actually like 
despicable people. This is the villainy that we want. We want the arrogant Sydney. We want Shan laughing as she does all these mastermind schemes and playing with the poor 19 year old boys. Uh, feelings. Uh, feelings. There's the word I was looking for. <laughs> but yeah, this is the stuff that I prefer to see, you know, not like actual real world concerns like, oh, this is a terrible human being. I want to watch them actually play the game and enjoy themselves and, and lean into the roles that they put themselves into. Yeah, because it's fun, and I feel, like we said it last week, and this week was only more so. Uh, this has been fun. This season has been fun so far. Yep. Uh, we led off talking about, uh, you know, the fun editing within the previous day on Survivor, or, you know, terribly throwing the challenge. But there was other fun stuff throughout, like even just the ephemera uh, parts of the episode, uh, you know, discovering the baby turtles, or, um, you know, the superhero that came to visit the tribe. <laughs> that was great. I've seen those little baby sea turtles. They're super cute. You're not allowed to touch them so yeah. like I'd, I'd watch them you know trying to make their way to the ocean so you can't touch them but i like help smooth out the path to help get one out to the ocean because they get stuck they can barely freaking move but if they get stuck they like bake in the sun so you kind of have to you know you can't touch them for whatever reason according to the wildlife guide people but like i can't just let them die they're too cute well i mean like i think i've seen stuff like that on uh, like National Geographic stuff. Usually they get like taken by predators. So I was like, where's the predators at? I don't want to see that. So no. I'm glad that, you know, the cameras and the castaways or whatever scared away the predators. So does, I mean, maybe they get eaten in sea, but that's fine. I don't need to see what's going on in the sea. So out of sight, out of mind. That's right. Uh, I love the reward win because it's like, we're going to have somebody come and show you how it works. And then he does like impossible shit, man. <laughs> like stuff that like Ozzy couldn't even do. All you got to do is climb up this 50 foot tree and then walk down downwards. We're just going to karate chop open. And just so, so you just hit it like this. Is that it? Gold star. I love it. Yes. All these skills that you cannot possibly learn in 20 minutes of <laughs> watching this man. Here you go. I think, you know, what they got out of it is like, oh, if we dip the fish in coconut, that's tasty. Like, I'm, that might be a lesson. <laughs> and I'm sure there were some other stuff, but I love that this guy is just doing this impossible stuff. Like, I don't know if I've seen anything more, like, unhelpful since the time one survivor where they're like, we catch fish by, like, having our cormorants catch them for it and tying their necks. It's like, cool, you giving me some cormorants? No? Okay, <laughs> then. I don't have trained birds back at camp. Can you uh, maybe dumb this down for me in some way? Yeah. Is there something I could do with a string? Maybe a net? Uh, like, I, I don't even remember that tribe had fishing gear. He was out there spearing stuff. It's like, had they already won that? Probably. I think maybe two tribes still won that, so maybe they did. Uh, but yeah, no, that was pretty funny. And yeah, like I said, JD getting chances to dunk. Um, Danny seems like a really good dude. Like the end of the reward challenge. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed Danny just being the ultimate team player and you know, like keep your chin up and like big coach slash dad energy. And I do not mean coach from Survivor. I mean actual like coach of a team. Um, like a coach dad vibe going there. And it's like, you know, you can do this pat on the back. You're, you're good. You gave it a hundred percent, blah, blah, blah. Good guy. A again, we don't know that he's a guy, good guy, but in the context of the yeah. show, good guy. In that scene, he did a good thing. It made me feel good. Which, yeah, we're getting a bunch of different moments like that. You know, we get, you know, Heather's, you know, emotional moment, which, yeah, good for her and all that. I honestly never really like when people, like, start, yeah, uh, feeling that bad about failing. But it's a mo uh, legitimate feeling, and I, mean, I don't begrudge her for it. But me, it's like, I've never found those uplifting the way that the show wants me to. Nope. It's like, yeah, sometimes you take the L, it happens. Um, frankly, I prefer more, like, yeah, when they fail in funny ways than when they just fail due to their shortcomings as humans. Uh, as competitors, really, not as humans. Um, but I do, like, the show, the season so far, has been giving us a lot of those moments of, hey, I like this person... I kind of like people, which both are, you know, not necessarily things that I'm inclined to believe. And that is what I wanted out of this season. So far, I believe it's delivering it, even if one of them has the temerity to do confessionals where they're leaning backwards. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like the comfort food that we wanted after such a long hiatus, right? 
Yeah, and like there's still betrayals, there's still blind sides, all that. Like that's fine, man. That's Survivor. Just you know, you don't need to be a jerk about it. And I don't feel like anybody is. Uh, a thought that's kind of been going around. I mean, we do have one tribe that is not lost at all, even when trying to do so. Uh, do you feel like they've been like horribly imbalanced, or do you think it's just one of those things? Little column A, little column B. I think um, they they don't necessarily know how well these people will perform in the challenges. There's mm-hmm. some randomness to it, um, a little bit of luck. Things can break certain ways. People could get injured. Who knows? Whatever. But yeah, there. It certainly does help to have a Danny on your team <laughs> when tasks tend to get physical in the early going. And that's what I think is more of the thing. I don't know if the tribes themselves were horribly imbalanced. I think when you have six on six on six, having a relatively young professional athlete might be a big advantage, you know? Um, and I think they might have encountered maybe like Heather, who seems to be the worst competitor of the field. Uh, now that we know that Tiffany can't miss, uh, things and, and maybe, yeah, uh, even the people who voted out, I don't know if any of them were good or bad. Maybe Abraham, who knows? Um, but she, competed the first week and then like this week and hadn't competed before so that really doesn't counterbalance it exactly and that's the thing is that once you have that strength early on you can sit your weakest links yeah because like yeah deshaun seems all right but is he that much better than brad or you know what voce would have been able to do if he was still in the game um or xander you know um like liana and jd are both ncaa athletes so i don't know if it's a case that there was like you know the show uh horribly imbalanced it and really wanted to i don't know if it's ever a case that the show really wants one tribe to win all the time i actually think that they don't I think it hurts the balancing of the editing and all that i just think that sometimes one or two people can make all the difference in the world. I think, you know, Joe's tribes tended to win because Joe was on them. Um, you know, having Tom and Ian was probably the bigger deal than the entire tribe that was self-selected. Um, so I, I think that might be it. Sorry. It was just a thought that just kind of came to me now. Uh, cause yeah, otherwise doesn't like, there doesn't seem to be a lot of people that are terrible at challenges. No, uh, uh with the exception of Tiffany in one challenge and then Heather tonight. Yeah. And these are the types of thoughts, by the way, that you could share in our comment section. Where would you find that comment section, Andy? That would be purplerockpodcast.com, your favorite survivor site that will never get accreditation by CBS for some reason or another. We just want press photos, and they won't let us. Like, why? First of all, we are a site, and I can't believe I have not mentioned this earlier this season. We are a site that has been offered to tell you, our listeners, about how we groom ourselves in our nether regions. We got that offer. That was really a highlight of the summer for me. <laughs> I know. It was like, you guys have been wanting so long to hear us expound at various levels of volume about our balls. Yet we decided to keep it pure that we weren't going to do that. We're, we're about the takes, man. I mean, I, I had no interest in the money. But I was tempted. <laughs> it was like, hmm, it would be funny. And you know I'm in for stupid humor. So it was tempting. But no, you, you, the listeners, have been spared talk of how Andy and I groom ourselves. I mean, we could just cut those takes now if we wanted. No, nah, that's good. Maybe just don't need the brand. It's like, hey, do you ever hate when things are getting a little long? And no, Anyway, this is a disaster. It is. So if you want fun interactions like this, you can always tweet at us. I am Purple Rock John, he's Purple Rock Andy, and the show is Purple Rock Pod, where you can find the live tweets pretty much every week. I've tried to slow it down a bit more so I can concentrate on the actual episodes, then maybe, you know, be able to give real thoughts in the podcast. I don't know if it's working or not. Let me know. Anything else? No, just hit some theme music. <laughs>